Hello, Wisconsin and Minnesota Dental Association Dental Association Me Association members. Woo! Um, happy Wednesday evening. Um, thank you so much for taking some time to join us tonight for a very special presentation sponsored by the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality. I am Candace Wagner, the Continuing Education and Special Programs Coordinator for the Wisconsin Dental Association. I'm excited to welcome you to Taking Care of Your Own Smile by Cultivating Well-Being During the Pandemic. As a reminder, this presentation is being recorded. So we ask that you keep your computers muted and that you turn off your video. We also encourage you, use, encourage you to use the chat book box at any time during the presentation to ask any questions that you may have and they'll be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. Now at this time, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Lori Barbeau. Thank you, Candice, and good evening and welcome everyone. I am Dr. Lori Barbeau and I am the Medical Director of Children's Dental Center and the Program Director of the Pediatric Dental Residency Program at Children's Wisconsin. I am pleased and to be asked by the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality Oral Health Collaborative to introduce our speaker for this very important topic. The WCHQ Oral Health Collaborative was formed in 2018 when five dental organizations came together to collect data, publicly report key dental quality indicators, and share best practices. When the pandemic hit, and as we all know, it hit the dental community quite hard. Jen Koberstein, who leads the Oral Health Collaborative at WCHQ, quickly pivoted to work on issues related to patient care, PPE, and how to keep the dental care team and our patients safe. As we all know, it is a challenge to care for others if you are not caring for yourself. Joining us, and in that regard, joining us this evening is Dr. Shyla Mirgain. Dr. Mergain is specializes in mind-body skills to cultivate well-being. She is a distinguished psychologist in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. She has received her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in clinical and community psychology and has completed her clinical internship at the University of Wisconsin Department of Psychiatry and her postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Mergain is a frequent contributor to CBS3 News in Madison and Wisconsin Public Radio, speaking on health, wellness, and peak performance. Often called on to represent UW in the media, she writes and speaks on mind-body skills to foster optimum health, especially now through the pandemic. And she was featured on the Today Show discussing skills to cultivate greater happiness in the workplace. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mergain and thank her for joining us, and we look forward to her presentation. Thanks so much, Dr. Barbo. I really appreciate such a warm welcome, and I want to thank the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality for sponsoring this event and making it possible. And I'd like to welcome all of you, the Wisconsin Dental and Minnesota Dental Association members. I'm so thrilled that you're sharing this time together and really looking forward to really talking about ways to cultivate well being, to really take care of your smile. So, I first just want to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Do you want to share your you know, first name and where you're from and even which uh, dental clinic or dental association you're affiliated with? That gives us a sense of who's here. And I was just commenting with a friend the other day, just saying, oh, it's so nice to see your smile now that we um, are, you know, if you're vaccinated, not having to wear masks. And I know people can really appreciate that that joy you get from really seeing one another smile. And when uh, the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality reached out to me about doing this, I didn't hesitate and said yes, because I have such deep admiration and respect for all of that you do. I um, was raised by parents who have had over the years some dental issues and seen some of the stressors and challenges that they've gone through. My mom as a young child had a lot of cavities and it was kind of traumatic back then 
you know, 1940s and 50s going to the dentist. And so she was very adamant about me taking care of my teeth and flossing and brushing. And my father, as he's aged, has needed some dental implants. And my parents don't have dental insurance. And as you know, it can be quite expensive. And so they actually, he got the dental work down in Belize at a dental clinic there because uh, they winter there during the, the colder months. And uh, I have a puppy, and I've gotten to, into brushing her teeth regularly, so I'm trying to pass on the good dental hygiene to my uh, fur babies. So again, you're welcome to um, just introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like to, where you're from, um, and just really uh, or what clinic you work in, and it's just a nice opportunity to see who's there. So. Um, we're going to be spending about the next hour uh, doing a presentation. Then we'll have time for questions and answers. So if you do have some questions, um, type that into the chat. And Candace uh, from the Wisconsin Dental Association will uh, she'll monitor those, and we'll get to those at the end. And I promise we'll be done by eight o'clock for the Bucks game. Those of you who are here in Wisconsin. So great. So let's get started. So let's talk about what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus on four different areas to really cultivate that sense of well-being. We're going to look at stress and burnout during the pandemic. We're going to look at ways to cultivate resilience in a changing landscape of dental health care. And I really have an appreciation of all the changes, the resilience, the strategies that you've had to deal with during the pandemic. And we're going to look at some specific mind-body practices to foster and improve well-being at work. And then lastly, looking at this notion of a ripple effect, being in awe of your ripple effect and the impact that it creates. So first, I'd like you to just bring to mind somebody who exhibits well-being in your life. Could be somebody during the pandemic that stayed very resilient. Maybe somebody you admire that was a teacher or mentor of yours. Could be a family member that seems to be really thriving during this time and flourishing. Or it could just even be somebody you read about, like a leader that you've read about. Then I'd like you to think about what characteristics do you associate with their well-being? What characteristics do you associate with their well-being? And you're welcome to type into the chat as you think about it. Kind of what kind of qualities, characteristics, behaviors, um, strategies do you associate with their well-being? Just take a moment to think about that. You know, what kind of qualities, characteristics do you associate with their well-being? And again, you're welcome to type that into the group chat. I'm aware I have a message here that not everyone their organization may not allow them to participate in chat. So I'm not sure how many people have the chat access or not. So even if you can't put it into the chat, you could think about, man, what are some of those qualities and characteristics? Okay. So we are going to start now looking at how can I cope more effectively with stress and burnout during the pandemic? We're certainly getting to a, a, you know, another side of the pandemic. We're not in the midst of crisis. But you know we're still in for a long ways to go till things really return to normal. So when we look at the impact of the pandemic, there has been a psychological toll. And I wonder if people can relate to this. The pandemic has left many people feeling drained, stressed out, and in poor health. You can think about for yourself, is that you know, something you can relate to? Um, we've, it's over a year and a half we've been in this. It's been like a long distance race we didn't even know we had to train for. And there's been some psychological impacts of having to deal with it. But let's look at some of the data. 40% of Americans say that because of the pandemic, they're experiencing higher levels of stress, depression, anxiety, or substance abuse issues. 53% of Americans report that their mental health has been negatively affected by worry and stress over the pandemic. And again, you can you know, just see, does, does this kind of relate to, does this seem like something that you've been dealing with or maybe people you work with or those people, um, you know, that your loved ones that you, that you live with, or even friends. Um, and then we also see that in the last couple months during the pandemic, there's been a new wave of pandemic health concerns. 61% reported experiencing undesired weight gain. 
67% said that they're sleeping more or less than they wanted to. 47% have delayed or canceled healthcare services. Maybe you've seen that in, in your clinic that patients have just canceled their, their routine cleaning or putting off that, um, you know, maybe the root canal or things like that. And then 23% are reporting drinking more alcohol to cope with their stress. And one of the groups that actually is at increased risk is healthcare workers, people who are working in healthcare along with people of color, um, parents of, of children, and even young people. Those are the, kind of the four areas that are most vulnerable during this time. And this is a really interesting graph, and this is based on research that has um, looked at some of the, the psychological impact of going through a crisis like a pandemic like COVID. And we go through these various stages. There's kind of the, the pre-disaster. Many of us can remember that a year ago, January, when we were hearing about COVID in Wuhan, and um, we thought, oh, it's not going to arrive here in the US. And then the impact, right, where everything shut down. And again, you can think about your clinic and what happened. You, you had to shut down. All of a sudden, you had to figure out how do we get PPE? How can we keep our, our um, patients safe if they're going to come in? Um, you had to create kind of different setups in the clinic, right, with protective shields. I know many dental clinics had to space out patients, so there's more time in between. How do we keep our staff safe? How do I keep myself safe? Um, you might have needed to change even just kind of how you arrive for an appointment, such as calling in. Um, and at that time, kind of after the impact, there was that heroic time where, you know, you remember in our country, we were celebrating the um, frontline workers. Um, we were we were seeing pictures of kids holding signs uh, for the the garbage uh, truck uh, delivery or pickup people um, for our postal service workers. Um, and there were a lot, you know, community kind of came together. It was often during lockdown that we it was kind of the sense of heroism. And probably in your own clinic, there was a lot of heroism as people were figuring out how do I kind of create this new normal in the clinic. Um, how do I get the PPA I need? What kind of new procedures do we need? Such as, I know when I went in, I had to swish my mouth with, with mouthwash uh, for my dental appointment for a minute, and she timed me. That was a long time to swish the, the mouthwash prior to the appointment um, or before the cleaning. Um, and then we kind of go into a honeymoon thinking, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get through this. Um, I think that might've happened, you know, around the time the vaccines were being developed. But then something happens after the honeymoon. We go into a phase of disillusionment. This can actually last for a year. We're certainly seeing a rise in cases with the Delta variant. Many people realize, goodness, I, you know, I haven't, things haven't returned to normal. And also during the disillusionment, there can be a sense of grief and loss and even processing some of the trauma that happened. Like maybe you lost a, a friend to COVID or maybe, um, your loved one uh, lost their job um, because of work-related changes to COVID. And then we move into this recovery and reconstruction um, that we're not quite yet there, but we're getting there. So we're thinking about, again, how can we work through this disillusionment to really tend to our emotional and physical well-being and work into this kind of recovery and uh, reconstruction of the new normal. And I think in this disillusionment phase, there are a couple things that we're seeing. There's one that we're seeing that kind of a depleted surge capacity, that we have the capacity to deal with a crisis for a short period of time. But a year and a half in, many people just feel exhausted. There's been a lot of um, work right now about a concept of languishing, where people just feel fatigued, like they've lost their sense of purpose, kind of like they're going through life um like they are going through life kind of like looking through life like it's a foggy mirror not seeing a, a great direction and that's because you know we we have this um, ability to deal with crisis but to live in it for a year and a half many of us start to just feel drained and so again you can think about is this something that you can relate to so we're going to do a poll here and candace is going to assist me with this. Um, and um, we're going to ask some questions related to the poll. Um, so here are her questions, and then we'll see. So we're just going to, again, have you think about what
What is it, what has it been like during the pandemic? And here's the poll question that you can answer. And this, um, we'll just get a cumulative um, response, so no one's gonna see your individual answers, so you can feel free to just answer honestly. We'll just see the cumulative results of the poll question. There's the question. How much have you struggled during the pandemic? A, I've never struggled. B, I've struggled a couple times. C, I've struggled occasionally, but not regularly. Or D, I have regularly struggled. So just take a moment to do that quiz or that poll. And Candace is going to monitor it and then tell us the results here. All right, it looks like everybody that wants to answer is finishing answering here. It looks like we have zero that have never struggled. Four that have struggled, um, B, can't see the full <laughs> answers here, um, C, 10, and then D, 10 as well. So it looks like we've had some occasionally and regularly struggling um, for half the participants. Okay, thank you so much, Candice. So yeah, so, um, and I think you might have to close the poll before I can start sharing again here. Okay, great. Okay, so we can see the majority of people have struggled occasionally or regularly, which I think is, is really normal. I think, you know, no one's really gotten out of this pandemic feeling like, hey, everything's fine and, and all is good. So um, I'd like you to now reflect on what has been challenging. You know, it is challenging to work in modern healthcare during a pandemic. It's it's tough, and, and you know, I was thinking prior to this, this the, the patients that you work with, some of you work with kids, who are very afraid of the dental appointment. You might work with somebody who needs a lot of different procedures um, and they're in a lot of pain or discomfort. Um, and um, you know, it, and you're working with a patient population that can have a considerable anxiety coming into the, the appointment. So it can be especially challenging, especially during um, COVID, right? When, especially during prior to the vaccine where people were there without a mask on, there might've been a real sense of vulnerability. So, and again, you're, you know, you're just welcome to reflect on just what some of those challenges have been in your clinic for you personally. You know, even just wearing a, a mask and, you know, the full PPE with the face shield for every day, um, five days a week, you know, that can take a toll. Um, feeling, you know, not being able to see one another smiles. There might be even with colleagues a sense that you have to social distance, you can no longer be in the break room eating lunch together. Um, and again, just all the changes, you know, your clinic had to probably shut down during the pandemic, then open up, then you might have had modifications. So it can feel like constant change. So again, how are you doing? So let's stop. Okay, okay, I'm hearing a little background noise there. So just making sure everyone is muting themselves, that would be great. And okay. So again, just kind of doing a little inner work and you're always welcome to share in the in the, the group chat, like what is going well in your practice working in dental health care? Like what has gone well this year? Maybe what do you feel proud of? What have been some of those successes and accomplishments? And then what, is, what have the challenges been? What are your stressors? And then how do you feel you're doing at this time in respect to burnout? You know, how does this compare with other times? And then what areas of self-care would most contribute to maintaining and building your overall well-being? So just thinking about some of that, and again, people are welcome to share in the group chat, but what's going well, what are the challenges, what are the stressors, how do you feel you're doing in relation to burnout? And just what areas of self-care would really be helpful right now in building and maintaining your overall well-being in this long distance pandemic marathon we're doing? So um, there's a, you know, it's interesting when we look at burnout overall and a large scale survey says that, you know, when you poll people working in healthcare, it's pretty striking 
doing 40 to 60% of healthcare workers are feeling burned out. And this is not pre-pandemic. So we can imagine during the pandemic, these numbers are gonna be higher. Again, you can just think about how are you doing? So we're gonna do a second poll here. And before Candace has launched it, I just want to explain it here. This is a burnout check-in. And this is a two-scale um, uh, burnout check-in that's based on the longer 22-item um, Maslow burnout inventory that correlates highly with the longer scale. So what we're going to have you do is rate yourself on a scale from 0 to 6. And here's the first question. I feel emotionally burned out or emotionally de depleted from my work. So zero would be not at all, and six would be a lot, okay? Here's a second, um, like all the time. So not at all, all the time. And then question two, I have become more callous towards people since I took this job, treating patients and colleagues as objects instead of humans. So let's, um, we're gonna turn it back over. Great. Okay. Great, we're gonna turn it over to Candace, who's gonna launch our second poll. Yep, just adding it in there quick. Okay, so I'm going to open the first question. Great, so they're just picking like if they're yep. one to six, okay, and then they just pick A for one or B for two. So again, one is, you know, not at all. I feel emotionally burned out or emotionally depleted from my work. So one is not at all, six is all the time. It's kind of the range we're working with. Great, and we can even then launch the second one when you're ready, Candace, and then we'll see where people are at. And again, your, your answers are anonymous. We just get that aggregate score. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll. Um, it looks like we have, so, one being not at all and two and then six being a lot. So um, we have two for not at all, five, 10, about 16 for in the middle. And then we get eight, nine, 10 towards, um, towards a lot. So sounds like people are a little stressed. And then I'm gonna go Great. ahead and add the, the second. second question. Oh, there's a little bit of a delay. And then again, we're just answering this question as how you're doing in the present moment. Kind of today, this week, right now. And that second question. Here we go. All right. Great. And again, I've become more callous towards people since I took this job, treating patients and colleagues as objects instead of humans. One, not at all, or six, you know, all the time, each day. All right, it looks like we have everybody that's going to answer answering. We have 11, that's not at all, um, 6 for number 2, 4 for 3 and 4, um, and then, whoop. sorry, there's a delay, it won't let me see the rest of the results. 
Okay, well, I think we have a good sense of it. So if people are a three or more on either one of the questions, kind of feeling like, gosh, these things are happening at least a few times a month, then they're actually experiencing burnout. So I think, um, you know, again, that's just something to think about of kind of where you're at. Right. Okay, so what leads to burnout? You know, there are individual factors and institutional factors. Institutional factors might have be just lack of control over office processes, lack of control over schedule, excessive paperwork, difficult and complicated patients, not enough time in the day, not enough time for self-care. And there are individual factors too. Um, lack of coping skills, personal bad habits, not enough time in the day, regret over chosen career, a sense of Perfectionism, you know, some perfectionism is good, but sometimes too much can lead us to be run ragged. So we can see it's a combination of sometimes we can change the system we're in, sometimes we can't. There's certainly a lot we can do individually. And why does it matter that when we are burned out, you know, can lead to other complications such as relationship issues with spouses or partners or colleagues or even poor patient relationships? Um, can have more prone to accidents, poor decision making, less empathy, medical errors, poor communication, health problems, and quitting in early retirement. So how do we work with this as we're working on this first skill? And we're going to talk about it in a couple different ways. This first one is based on the, out of the work of Dr. Kopaz, who is a psychiatrist um, at the VA, and he has written a lot about this. And I think it's a really interesting framework. He talks about something called the, he the healer's journey, that if you're in healthcare, you're a healer, and how similar to the hero's journey based on Joseph Campbell. And he talks about how, you know, when you go into the, he the helping profession, like dental health care, there's kind of a call that you have to become, you know, working in this area, to become that healthcare worker. And then as you're going on your journey, you think about connecting with mentors, then you face some challenges and trials and tribulations like dealing with the pandemic. Then as you round the corner, you actually, it's very common to go through a phase of burnout, disorientation, and soul loss. But then as you keep going around the corner, you think about how do I recover that sense of purpose, that sense of heart, that sense of um, direction, you keep moving, how do you recover a sense of authority, purpose, how can you transform suffering and, dissociate, and disorientation? So I just put this in there not to judge ourselves if we are feeling somewhat burned out or we remember a time recently where we have. It's actually part of um, our, you know, the path as a healthcare worker. So the second thing I want to mention when we think about managing burnout and stress is how do we catch it early? I think about stress and burnout kind of like a boiling pot of water that with a frog. Like if a frog jumps in a boiling pot of water, it's gonna jump out and live. But if you put a frog in a pot of water and slowly bring it to a boil, it's not gonna jump out. And I think that's kind of like burnout. You know, stress, we can jump out, we can find those inner resources and deal with it versus burnout that we start to like that languishing, lose purpose, lose energy, lose vitality. So I have in here just the importance of catching stress early and working on regular recovery. So catching that stress early that you can see here with this, piece, this optimal performance graph that um, when there is a lot of stress, that performance goes down, right? And if it's high for a long period of time, that's when we're vulnerable to burnout. Versus if there's no stress, we kind of feel bored, right? Like you think about, if you had a day where there's no patients, no paperwork, you'd probably be pretty bored. So, um, oops, and I'm hearing some feedback there. So hopefully people can mute themselves or Candace, you might help mute, mute people too, that'd be great. So we want to work with, how do we stay? As you can see here, there's a column here of the optimal zone where there's some stress, stress, but we're also working on regular recovery. I like to think about it as a teeter-totter, that we have stress happening, and you can kind of see it, but then we want to work on regular recovery to keep our physiology in balance. And what can happen, especially when we think about that depleted surge capacity, is we had all this stress, 
but we didn't have the regular recovery and we kind of got stuck in that stress zone. So we have these two parts of our central nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is that stress response. We want to activate that parasympathetic nervous system to keep our system in balance. So here again, kind of like that frog jumping out of that, that boiling pot of water, we want to look at some of our stress warning signs and symptoms. So we can work on active recovery after we experience that stress. Again, that helps us stay resilient to burnout. There might be some cognitive symptoms, physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, behavioral symptoms. So just take a look at this graph and just see if you can recognize what I call your stress signature. When you're stressed, kind of what happens? How can you identify it when that sympathetic nervous system turns on? What happens in your mind, in your body, in your emotions, in your behavior? And it's helpful to know that because if we again can catch it, oh, I'm in that stress mode, that sympathetic nervous system, then you can do things for recovery. Now, there are a lot of things we could do for regular recovery from stress, you know, getting a good night's sleep, exercising, spending time in nature, um, getting a hug, um, connecting with loved ones, doing therapeutic journaling, um, keeping things in perspective. All of that can be ways of regular recovery. We're going to work with one practice that is really, really powerful. We're going to be working with our breathing. And in particular, when we're stressed, we tend to breathe really shallow in our chest. And what can happen when we're working in healthcare is that many of our patients are coming in really anxious and stressed. As a result, they're going to have a lot of sympathetic activation in their body, a lot of stress chemicals going, and they're going to breathe really shallow. What we inadvertently can do is start to match that physiology. And if we're spending our whole day in that stress response, we're going to wear down our system, get too stressed and burned out. So what we're going to do is work a little bit with our breathing. So again, I mentioned when we're stressed, we tend to breathe really shallow in our chest. That activates that stress response or that fight or flight response. We get tense, it aggravates stress and anxiety, and it keeps kind of that negative thinking hooked and entangled. So instead, what we want to work on is working on slower, lower breathing or belly breathing. So we want to imagine the stomach's like a balloon. As we're breathing in, the stomach is expanding with air like a balloon filling with air. As we breathe out, the stomach is going to go in towards the spine like a balloon deflating. Breathing in, stomach is expanding with air like a balloon filling. Breathing out, stomach is going to go in towards the spine like a balloon deflating. And what this is doing is activating that relaxation response or parasympathetic nervous system, that other part of our physiology to keep our system in balance. And this kind of breathing during the workday, it's like flooding your body with beneficial chemicals. It lessens stress and improves mood. It gets us more present in the moment, reduces muscle tension, it helps with sleep. And it's probably one of the best things we can do for our well-being. I know when I'm working with a challenging patient and that person's in a lot of distress, I go to my breathing and start to do that. And that patient over time will start to match my breathing and will start to relax. Um, so we're going to do a little practice here. So what I invite you to do is you might put a hand on your chest, hand on your stomach. Just take a couple breaths and just notice where in your body you're breathing. Might be up in the chest or might be in the stomach. Just get curious about where you're breathing. Then what I'm going to invite you to do after you notice that is you might put two hands on your stomach, imagining that the area is like a balloon. And I'm going to have you just breathe in and out, trying to do slower, lower breathing or belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing. And in particular, I'd like you to breathe in and then just see if you can breathe out a little bit longer. So the first step is just to notice the breath, kind of trying to get it slower and lower in your body, doing that diaphragmatic breathing. Then the second step is to lengthen the out breath. So you might breathe in for three or four, then breathe out for five or six. Breathing in for three or four, out for five or six. Great, so just really lengthening the out breath. We're lengthening the out breath because that is what's calming to our system. That activates our parasympathetic nervous system. And the last step is just to slow down the pace of the breath. Usually say between four to eight breaths a minute. So on average about six breaths a minute. So just see if you can slow down the pace. You might just see as you're breathing if you can just release any unnecessary muscle tension. 
So I call this the power 10 breath practice of just doing this for 10 breaths. It can really help reset your physiology, get you in that optimal performance zone and it can really help you recover from stress. To keep, it's really protective against burnout. So great practice that I encourage you to work with. Okay, so we worked on skill one, really working on stress and um, burnout, becoming aware of some of the factors that are contributing to it and ways to really stay stress hardy and um, protect from, from burnout. So we're gonna now look at resilience, ways to cultivate resilience. And if you look at the cartoon here, we have the heart and the brain in conversation. So the heart is saying, oh, look at all the good, look at all the good, look at all the good <laughs> to the brain. <laughs> and what's that, what is the brain doing? And the brain is saying, no, not, not now, can't you see I'm busy? Looking at the one bad thing. Isn't that kind of how life can be? So we're gonna look at, do a little work around our thinking. Our thinking is automatic and powerful. It's based on past learning. It's hard to control. It links with other feelings and emotions. And we have this negativity bias of the brain. You think back in caveman times, our ancestors survived because they had to anticipate the dangers out there like the saber-toothed tiger. They had to ruminate, they had to focus, they had to plan, they had to remember how to deal with the saber-toothed tiger. So they're ready at any moment when the saber-toothed tiger jumped out at them they would be prepared. The good stuff, like what they had for dinner, who they fell in love with, the vacation they're gonna to go to, that stuff, yeah, it was nice, but it had it didn't have the same survival benefit that if they didn't plan, didn't prepare, didn't remember, it wasn't gonna kill them. So we have this, you know, this negativity bias that really served us for centuries and in our ancestors, but in modern lifetime, little things like being stuck in traffic or, problematic patient can feel like the saber, like, um, like the saber tooth tiger. So as I said, this brain has a, a bias towards negativity. So we're gonna do a little experiment here around the negativity bias of the brain. I'd like you to read this quickly. Okay, what did you read? Huh. How many people here read Opportunity Now Here versus Opportunity Nowhere? I think if we're doing a poll, Candace was polling everyone, we'd probably see most people would, would be reading Opportunity Nowhere. Again, our mind goes immediately to the negative. We're more likely to remember the negative than positive, more likely to learn the negative than positive. But we can actually flip this because what can happen is when we get into negative thinking, there's kind of like this domino effect. You know, if we think about the stressor and the kind of thoughts that can come up in the domino effect and the impact it has on us. So again, just thinking about in your own life when stress shows up, what is your mind telling you? What kinds of automatic thoughts pop up? And then when you're hooked by these thoughts, these thoughts can be sticky, kind of like they hook us. <laughs> what do you do next? Usually it's, you know, it's not great coping that we're doing. We might get into some react reactivity that can happen. You can think about you know, stress in the workplace when stress happens there or has happened, where does your mind go? And then what do you do? And then what's the consequence to you? So we're gonna work with this because we can actually find that we can start to shift our pattern of thinking. And we're gonna do some work in this section and the next section um, around really looking at um, what we're, we're learning about neuroplasticity in the brain that you know, these old, um, these thoughts, there's this expression, neurons that fire together, sorry, neurons that wire together, fire together. So the sense that we can have these neuronal pathways in the brain, like stress happens, these neuronal pathways that get activated, the automatic thoughts happen, automatic behaviors happen. But we can actually rewire things by choosing different kinds of thoughts, do choosing different kinds of behaviors and really cultivate that sense of bouncing back more quickly from difficulty. So one of the first strategies we can do is look at a stressor, not as a threat or loss, but as a challenge. We certainly saw this during COVID that people who really approach the virus thinking about it as a challenge, you know, what can I learn? How can I grow from this? How can I problem solve around this? How can I keep myself and loved ones and my colleagues safe? did much better versus when they thought of it as a threat. Oh my gosh, you know, this virus is gonna attack me or loss or oh my goodness, 
you know, we're losing so much as a society. So again, this is kind of a superhero power of viewing it as a challenge and help you bounce back and stay much more resilient. Also really managing our mind that when we're hooked by those negative thinking, negative thoughts, to choose a different kind of thought that's helpful, something that's more realistic, reassuring, and peaceful. So coming up with a mantra or coping self-statement we can say can really keep things in perspective. And then we find that the work of um, Barbara Fredrickson finds that people who are really resilient and has well-being, have well-being in their life, have something called a three to one positivity ratio. That to every bad thing, they have three positives that are occurring, that they're noticing. And what the work shows um, in positive psychology is it's not that these people are so lucky or everything is going so well or everything, you know, life is a bed of roses but instead they are just noticing the good stuff. And again, when we go back to the neuroplasticity of the brain with that negativity bias, again, our mind's gonna to go to the negative. What would it be like to start to notice the good, appreciate the good, favor the good? Um, you know, and yeah, the bad's there, but there's a lot of good stuff that sometimes is there and we, we take for granted. I will say the work of Barbara Fredrickson says in healthy workplace teams, there's a five to one positivity ratio for every negative interaction. There are five positives in their workplace. So we can also think about kind of what are we bringing to our workplace teams? You know, are we bringing kind of the complaining, the gossiping, the griping, or are we bringing more of that positive? And we're gonna talk about that uh, at the end here today of just some strategies. So um, when we think about that negativity bias of the brain, when something bad happens, it quickly encodes in our memory but when something positive happens, it actually, we need to linger with it for at least 12 seconds for it to be fully encoded in our memory. So the skill of savoring, appreciating the good that you might have maybe taken for granted. This is the work of Rick Hansen, and he talks, has this taking in the good exercise that I'd like us to do right now. We're going to do it in a couple different ways. But I'd like you to just think about something positive that's, that's happened recently, maybe even today. It could be. Um, could be a nice meal you had, or somebody paid you a compliment, or maybe it was an easy commute to work, or you had a nice patient interaction. And just bring it to mind, and then just see if you can re-experience it, almost like it's virtual reality. Kind of sensing it, using all your senses, breathing it in. Almost like you're breathing it in like a sponge into your body, into your mind, into your emotions. You might even, you might even um, just even kind of extend it or enliven it in more color or in more color or vibrancy as you just soak it in. Great. What's that taking in the good? That's a really powerful practice, especially if something, you know, is happening, you know, a way to do that is um, you know, sharing it with somebody, uh, expanding on it. I love when people say, tell me more, tell me more about what went well. I want to hear all the details. And that allows me to fully uh, kind of savor it for that 12, 15 seconds. Another practice to really, again, get to that three to one tipping point and really cultivate resilience. And yeah, bad stuff's happening, but there's a lot of good stuff happening. And that is just gratitude. This is the work out of uh, Martin Seligman who says, um, he did a lot of research that looked at the power of just reflecting on three good things that went well. So he had brought students into the lab and had them for several months do a gratitude practice. And he had them write down three good things that went well and the possible causes daily. And he found after a week, people were 2% happier, four weeks, 5% happier, and six months, 9% happier. A lot of benefits of gratitude in terms of enhancing positive emotion, helping to alleviate distressing feelings, helping you adjust and cope, and really strengthens and nurtures relationships. So I'd like you to just practice, just think about it. If you had a piece of paper there, you can even write it down. What, is, what are three good things that have happened today? Might be you can attend this, this webinar, or the Bucks are playing later tonight, or you had a nice interaction with somebody at work. You're grateful for your job. It's summertime in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Stopped raining here. <laughs> Great. So just thinking about that, and then just notice what it was like to 
to reflect on what you're grateful for and the impact it had on your mood and overall well-being and sense of resilience. Great. And lastly, because we're this section, we're talking about resilience. I just wanted to share um, this book, Resilience, the Science of Mastering Life's Greatest Challenges by Southwick and Charney. And, you know, again, resilience is a skill that can be learned. And they just, you know, again, there are lots of different ways to cultivate resilience, like having the positive attitude that we've been talking about, a cognitive flexibility, again, viewing it as a challenge versus threat or loss having a moral compass or role models, or having those active coping skills, social support, physical well-being, facing your fears, recognizing and fostering signature strengths, and just training regularly. So if people want to dive deeper, I'd recommend this book. All right, so we're going to go into skill three. We've been working on stress and burnout, cultivating resilience. Now let's look at some mind-body practices we can take into our workplaces to take care of our smile and really strengthen our well-being in the workplace. We're going to look at some mindfulness here. First, just some research around it. Um, that there was a, a really famous study in the journal Science, and they pinged people during the day. And they asked them during the day, what are you doing? Where's your mind? What are you focusing on? And how happy are you? And they found that 47% of the time, people were not paying attention. And why is that problematic? Well, they found that when people's minds were wandering, they were less happy, they were unproductive, they're feeling mentally off task and feeling scattered both individually and organizationally. So I like to joke that almost half of you aren't paying attention to me right now, your mind is wandering. So I like you to just think about, you know, how do you stay focused on the important things and what are some of those distractors? Are they sensory and emotional? Um, do you take time off to be mindful and enjoy the simple pleasures of life? And what's the impact to your well-being when you're distracted or interrupted? You know, you can think about what are those distractions? Is it a colleague interrupting you or phone calls or all the charting you have to do or um, some challenging coworkers that, you know, take up a lot of your time? And you know, what hooks you? Okay, so when we think about mind-body skills, we're going to talk about mindfulness. John Kabat-Zinn is a, a researcher out of the University of Massachusetts, and he has this definition. Mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. And I've heard, done retreats with him, and he's added this sentence at the end, and so I've included it in here, as if your life depended on it. Because um, you know, mindfulness is really about being here now. So more of life can show up and more of you can, can show up as well. So 18 million Americans currently practice meditation. So we're going to go to our last poll here. And great. And this poll is, I'm going to ask you, um, how, you know, do you practice, do you have a meditation practice? You have a personal meditation practice. You know, maybe you've never tried meditation or tried meditating a couple times or practice occasionally but don't have a formal practice or have a regular meditation practice. So Candice is going to put the poll together. Yep, just give me a second to upload all Great. of this. And thanks to Candace for all her work here of navigating these polls, some of the tech tech challenges. So we appreciate you doing this. No problem at all. Should be almost set when putting the last option in. Great. All right. Okay, again, it's anonymous, your answers. We'll just have that aggregate score at the end. So let's take the poll.
Okay, it looks like people's answers are coming in. All right, it looks like um, 11 of us have never tried it. Nine of us have, three of us practice occasionally, and no one does it regularly. Okay, well, after today, thanks so much, Candace. And after today, everyone will have uh, tried a, a meditation practice. So great. So let's again look at some of the neuroscience around. Um, think about these mind body practices that mindfulness can improve stress management, reduce anxiety, help lower blood pressure, strengthen immune response, boost working memory, reduce inflammation, improve attention and focus, and help dealing with depression. I just wanted to highlight a few specific studies. There was um, a famous study that was done here in Madison with Promega Biotech Company and the Center for Healthy Minds and Dr. Richie Davidson, who's one of the pioneers in this, in this area of research. And they two took a, a group of employees. The first half got the eight-week mindfulness course. And John Kabat-Zinn actually would fly to Madison each week to teach the course, which is kind of cool. This is way back in 2003. The other half um, was a waitlist control, so they took the, the course later. And this is what's fascinating, again, when we think about the neuroscience, that the brain electrical activity was different between the two groups. After just the eight weeks, people, they had um, greater left prefrontal cortex activation, and people reported more optimism, vigor, enthusiasm, and buoyancy. People also responded better to the flu vaccine. And the right prefrontal cortex was less active. People reported having less anger, fear, anxiety, and depression. And this data has, has um, been found time and time again with mindfulness practices. And then what they find is in as little as two weeks, we start to see some of these changes happening in the brain. That, um, again, there, we're strengthening the, the prefrontal cortex, areas associated with concentration and focus. Also, people are reporting less emotion dysregulation. Um, there's also less mind wandering and um, kind of intrusive thinking as well plus all the physiological benefits. And this study I think is fascinating. So this was a review of four different studies that had different approaches to mindfulness meditation. And they looked at the telomeres on the end of the chromosomes. This really speaks to epigenetics, that our genetic expression is really shaped by kind of the soup we're living in, our environment, our lifestyle. And, they find, and as we age, our telomeres shrink. So longer telomeres indicate a longer life and less chronic illness. And they found that all four studies, with 190 people, found that at the end of the meditation training, it's probably eight weeks or so, people's telomeres were significantly longer, indicating that it actually lengthened um, their life and also made them less likely to get chronic illness. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So as promised, we're going to do a little practice here. And I'm hopeful it'll work, Candace. If it doesn't, maybe you could let me know. Um, that I click the right button. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little mindfulness around sound. And I'm going to play a chime. And I just asked you to I asked you to really notice this in the way that John kabat is describing it, in the moment, non-judgmentally, on purpose, in a particular way. And with all these practices, when we're doing a mind-body practice or mindfulness practice, it's always nice to just get into a comfortable position that indicates you're starting the practice. You might have your spine straight, head up. You could have your eyes open or eyes closed. Might take a few of those slower, deeper breaths just to arrive in the moment, dropping back and into yourself. And then we're just going to notice the sound here. You can notice it non judgmentally, almost like it's beginner's mind that you're noticing it for the first time, like you've never heard such a sound in your life. So let's just try this. Okay, great. And I'm assuming the sound uh, went through. So just what did you notice by bringing mindful awareness to sound? 
some of you might have noticed your mind is might have wandered because that's what minds do might have noticed <laughs> might have noticed um, something really particular about the sound um, so just you know what did you observe there and what we used here we use sound as an anchor to focus on and you know anything can be an anchor I, I always use my breath a lot that power 10 practice that can be a mindfulness practice to really drop into the present moment you could use um, mindfulness of of um, eating like taking a mindful sip of a beverage or that mindful first bite um, you could do mindful movement research shows that um, seated practices are helpful, but also active practices like movement, like when you're exercising or taking a walk in nature can be equally effective. So when we're working with these mind-body practices, we're really strengthening those neuronal pathways in our brain associated with well-being. And we are strengthening that ability to focus, to manage our emotions, to unhook from thinking, so we can really be present with our lives. So I want to also share a second mind-body practice I personally use a lot. This is based on um, University of Wisconsin's Department of Family Medicine came up with this. It's the three P's practice. I think about this as a threshold experience, like when you're walking in to greet your next um, patient, or maybe you're cleaning the, the chair they were sitting in, or right when you're arriving home from your work day really helps us drop into the here and now and pay attention to what matters. So here's the three P's. The first P is to pause, the power of the pause. Just stop. Stop what you're doing. Where is your mind? And then the second P is presence, bringing your attention into this moment and breathing deeply. Thinking about what is the situation asking of you? The third P is to proceed using mindful speech, action, and positive intention, being gentle with yourself. So think about having a, you know, having maybe these transitions, or it could be when you're sitting down and maybe answering email, you can think about pausing, presencing, and proceeding. Great, and it can really help you leave where you were, what you're just doing, and coming back into kind of what, what's calling, what's asking what's um, required of you right now, what the situation is asking of you. So as we end this section and go to our final section, I'd like you to just think about how could I cultivate some mindfulness in daily life? There's some wonderful apps out there, um, great YouTube channels that have mindfulness, or even just having that cue or anchor, like when I first sit down and turn on my computer or I start my car or, I, or I'm eating a meal with my family. But also be when you first wake up or before going to sleep. Um, during the day, you might be aware of you know, various things when you're sending the email, rating the line, daily activities while exercising. I should have put in here, uh, this is my bad, when you're brushing your teeth or flossing, that would be a great time to practice mindfulness, wouldn't it? You're gonna, you're gonna brush your teeth, you're probably all gonna be flossing. That would be a great time to practice mindfulness. All right, our last skill. So we've been working on stress resilience, preventing burnout, um, cultivating overall resilience, those mind-body practices to strengthen well-being. And our final skill for tonight is just to be in awe of your ripple effect. Let's focus here. I, I, I think you know this is um, such an important area right now. Um, Mother Teresa has this quote, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the water to create many ripples, that ripple effect. And to become in awe of our ripple effect, what is awe? This is how it's been defined, that goosebump feeling that we get when we come across something so strikingly vast in complexity, scope, or number, that it alters the way that we experience life and understand the world and allows us to see things differently. Awe shifts our perspective. It shifts from our own little place in the world to something so much bigger than ourselves. It literally forces us to revise our mental models of what is actually possible. So, you know, thinking about awe and, you know, your, your life and, um, and again, just having that sense of awe of what you do in the world, the contribution you make, the difference that you make. 
And again, really cool research that awe as an emotion actually lowers our inflammation, lowers the risk for heart disease and depression, even Alzheimer's disease. And um, people who had more awestruck moments had the lowest level of interleukin-6, a marker of inflammation. Nagus is a sense of hope and provides a feeling of fulfillment. And we think about the awe of our ripple effect, you know, what um, difference you're making, the contribution you're making. So take a moment to just be in awe of the impact you're having on your patients, your colleagues, your family and friend, and even the courage it's taken to be a dental health care provider, work in dental health during a pandemic. You know, so many of you are on the front, we're on the front lines, continue to be on the front lines. You know, there's so much to be in awe of, and just the work and the nature of itself, caring for, for people's smiles and their teeth and their dental health. You know, if you take care of your dental health, you're taking care of your health for life and quality of life for one's entire life. So it's no small thing. So I'd like you to think about, you know, your purpose. Kind of, what is your purpose? What really matters? Why are you here on the planet? What do you want your well-being for? Again, when we think about that ripple effect, sometimes when we have this kind of clarity, you know, and awe of what we've accomplished, that sense of purpose, that can be like that northern light that we're steering by during those challenging times. And research shows that when people do have a stronger sense of purpose in life, they just live longer. There's a, a survey of people, and they were followed for 14 years, and they were asked three questions about meaning and purpose, like, I don't wander through life, I think about my future, there's still more to do in life. And they found that regardless of their age, retirement status, relationships, and depression, people live longer if they had that sense of purpose, live healthier, longer lives. So again, you can think about that purpose. And I'm gonna go back to that um, positivity ratio in our final minutes here, in that five to one tipping point in healthy workplace teams. Um, you know, our personal three to one, tipping point five to one. And you can just think about, again, that ripple effect, that purpose. You know, how can you keep making a difference in creating that positive environment in your workplaces and in the world? And, you know, what's, what's so interesting is when we are offering kindness, when we're offering generosity, when we're giving to others, that is actually one of the best things we can do for our well-being. And that leaves a legacy in ways we, we can't even fully comprehend. You know, there's, um, if we're giving to others, we are happier, right? If we're happier, then others become happier. And then even, you know, then if people are receiving those acts of kindness, you know, they're more likely to offer them to somebody else. You can think about in the workplace, checking in, small gifts, thank you notes, recognizing effort, connecting in conversation, words of encouragement, expressing appreciation or celebrating successes. You know, how can you be the person who's helping getting your team, workplace team to the five to one tipping point? You know, of doing these small little acts of kindness in the world. Um, and uh, just ending with a, a little compassion practice that I'd like us to do all together. There has been um, research showing that compassion practices, having compassion for ourselves, self-compassion, and compassion for others really helps people feel a sense of connectedness and can really boost a sense of positive emotion. So it can be nice to do with strangers. It can be nice to do with people we live with every day um, or even you know, colleagues that maybe we're having some tension with. And you can think about just when you are encountering people, asking them, asking yourself, what is life like for this person? And then simply extending a kind thought, wishing that that person be happy, well, peaceful, and free of suffering. Again, just noticing what impact the silent practice might have. So what we're going to do is we're first going to offer this compassion practice to ourselves and self-compassion. And then let's just offer it to everyone here and all our workplaces, our colleagues, our administrators, our patients the larger community and the world at all, at large. Let's just first offer to ourselves, you might even put your hand on your heart if you feel comfortable or just have your hands at the side. Uh, again, adopting that position, you can sit in, just inviting in the start of this practice, your feet on the ground, taking a few deep cleansing breaths. You can just imagine facing yourself or even somebody who cares about you facing you, saying these words. 
May I be happy, well, peaceful, and free of suffering. Let's extend this wish out to everyone here on this webinar, all the people who helped organize it, all the clinics, everyone's affiliated with it, your colleagues, your patients, administrators who helped run those settings, and even the larger community in the world at large. May we all be happy, well, peaceful, and free of suffering. And just take one last cleansing breath to just end this practice. All right. Well, it's been such an honor and privilege to be with you today. I want to thank you to all the organizers and the sponsor and all of you attending. It's been such a delight to be here. And I'd like you to just think about one action step. This is our call to action. What is one positive change or action step you can take back to strengthen your well-being in the world? And you might jot it down, but you just share it with a coworker tomorrow. Um, one thing you're going to work on, you might think about what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, who you can share it with. It help strengthen your well being and the workplace overall, well, workplace well being. Um, and just want to also share my email address. Um, if people have questions or want to follow up, that's great. I also do have a professional Facebook page, Dr. Shyla Mergain, where I share articles. And interviews and tips related to some of what I've talked about and other areas related to well-being. So feel free to like that professional page, Dr. Shailen Mergain, and you have my email if you want to be in touch. Um, I'm going to turn it over back to Candice, and if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. And um, just want to wish you all well-being, happiness, peace, peace, and um, joy as you go through, through your days. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. I am like feel like I'm ready for a nap. <laughs> um, if everybody who has any questions, go ahead and send them through the chat and I will make sure that they get answered. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you've learned some things that you can take away and share within your office, within your family, your friends, um, just to kind of spread some, some well-being. Um, we will, like I said, this was recorded and I will be posting um, the link um, within 24 to 48 hours um, if you want to review again or share with those that um, you may work with that weren't able to join us tonight. Um, so far, no questions have come through. Um, you do have her email address if you would like to reach out to her personally. Um, I know some of this stuff may be um, personal, so go ahead and reach out to Dr. Morgan on your own if you would like. All right. What do you say? Should we call it a night? Yeah, thanks, everyone, and don't hesitate to reach out with any follow-up questions. All right. Thanks Have so much for being here. Awesome. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.